G'day viewers, my name is Graham Stevenson and I'd like to invite you to come on a journey of creativity and learning and adventure through the series Colour in Your Life. There's an artist in every family throughout the world and lots of times there's an artist deep down inside all of us as well. So grab your kids, your brothers, your sisters, your aunties, uncles and mums and dads and come and see how some of the best artists in Australia do what they do. Well, good day viewers and welcome back to Colour in Your Life. Well, we're down in southern Victoria today at a lookout called Bunjil Lookout in a valley or an area called Moorabool. That's it. And I am with one of the premier watercolour artists of the world, not nationally, internationally famous. This woman's an amazing human being, Amanda Hyatt. G'day, Graham. <laughs> welcome to the Thank show. Thank you for having me. That's just, just amazing. Now, Amanda's doing a plain air picture for us today. and. We're literally, it's just so picturesque, you'll actually see these at later on as we uh, pan across the horizon. But it's just going to be a fantastic day. Before we even start, I'm going to have to thank a gentleman, I think you know who I'm talking about, Mr Luke Senior. Uh, Luke has been so much behind Colour in Your Life, yeah. he's been absolutely fantastic guy, isn't he? He's a one, wonderful man. And, and, and Senior's Arts really has gotten behind Colour in Your Life and enabled us to once again come down and work with one of the best watercolour artists, uh, colour artists in the world. So we really have to thank Luke for all he's done and also Daniel Smith. Yeah. Daniel Smith is a big part of uh, the worldwide watercolour situation really, isn't it? Aren't they? They're, they're just amazing. Absolutely. I don't know whether people know that um, Luke's got three shops, one in Frankston, That's one right. in Melbourne City yep. and his one at Malvern. Absolutely. Brilliant shops, brilliantly supplied and um, couldn't be a better place to go. Yeah. And I'd say Australia-wide. He's a fantastic guy and you just go in there. If you want to know anything about art and obviously <laughs> watercolour art, and he's, he knows all of the best in the world, Amanda being one of them, uh, go in and say hi to Luke, he's a fantastic guy. Yeah, and I thank him personally for yeah, um, tremendous man. his uh, encouragement of my art. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool. But when you see what Amanda does, I mean, Amanda's one of those really, really proficient professional people that does so much with so little. Uh, she's, she's that good that you're going to watch this thing appear on the page in front of you and you're going to go, oh my God, how did she do that? But that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go to the other side of the lookout, look across the beautiful Moorabool area. Moorabool Valley. Moorabool Valley. Mm. And we're going to make a start on a piece. So come along for the ride, guys. Absolutely. Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Amanda, now before we start your picture, you, as a professional artist, have developed five steps for watercolour painting. Can you explain those to us? Absolutely. Look, over my career of 30 years, I've worked it out. There are five things that you must achieve in a painting, and if one of them is incorrect at the end of the painting, it will guide you as to how to make a, a painting a piece of art rather than just a painting. So first of all, I better explain the difference between piece of art and painting. I think anybody can paint. My dog could paint. If you put paint on its feet and walked it across a piece of paper, it would be a painting. But is it art? I don't know. I think art needs sensitivity, intellect and emotional input from the artist. And I think there's a big difference between an artist and a painter. So to achieve a piece of art, I think the five steps required are, one, not to be too literal to your subject matter. I see the big picture first and then I do the details at the end. So when I look out at the view that we're looking at, which is right in front of me here, I see the big picture first. So the first step is to make it a more artistic thing rather than be literal to the scene. Now point number two is all about colour. You don't have to be literal to the colour either or either. 
So if you see a blue sky, it doesn't have to be blue, it can be pink, it can be grey, it can be yellow, sunset. Always better to paint morning or afternoon, you get lots of light and shadows and so forth. So colour, you, you apply it to anything, a river doesn't have to be blue, it can be muddy, it can be grey. I think a lot of my students are so bound up with rules and being literal, they have actually, they don't see the big picture like I see the big picture a lot. Uh, the third thing is the tone. It's essential to have light, middle and dark. Darks are so necessary because without them there's no light and light is what my sort of painting is about which is realist impressionist watercolour done along the lines of the old French Impressionists and the Australian Heidelberg School Impressionists and it's all about capturing the light, capturing some sort of mood, magic, which turns your painting into a piece of art. So that third point, introducing tone, three tones, essential. That's where my students, a lot of my students get stuck on, they can't move past that point. Point four is creating the magic through glazes re-going into areas, fixing mistakes. A lot of art is about deceiving the viewer, dare I say, but from a distance, details aren't really necessary. Impressionist art from a distance comes together where you've juxtaposed the lights and the darks. So my paintings look a mess all up close but in my head and I've worked it out where the lights and darks go impressionistically so when you get back from it they take your eye. I try to do a painting such that when you're away from it it has an energy that pulls you to it and you want to go and look at it and you can see it from a distance equally as interestingly as it is close up. The fifth point is pulling it together. That means putting all your details in, balancing it up and making it into a, a piece of art. It's a very flat horizon so I'm taking the liberty because there's no rules and mm -hmm. I want the picture to look good. Mm -hmm. It's my decision because I have artistic license to do what I want with that. So I'm just going to either raise it or, or dip it. So in this case I'm just going to put something there so that line is not straight. Now the rest of the valley, we have to incorporate the river which comes through here, switches down the front and goes out there and the vineyards and the foreground. Foregrounds are notoriously difficult to paint, so they're best just left done quickly. Edges are difficult to paint, so they're best done darker, so your eye throws into the centre. There are always areas in a painting that are fudged, I call it fudged, right. because they're difficult to do. You really don't need them. And instead of putting details there, like on the edges and so forth, it will distract you from what the whole painting is about. So these fudge areas are deliberately fudge areas just so you don't have to deal with them too, too much. So just filling in and looking out at that huge vista. When I say I draw it up, I don't draw it up. I position things where they should be. So we get started on the actual painting now. So a graded wash, hag brush, nice big one. Yep. I'm always dipping onto a towel. I'm always dipping in there, washing it off, dipping it off, just keeping it clean. Yep. Towel over the shoulder all the time. And just keep it running so you get a nice, clean, graded wash down to the top of the hill area. My colours are pretty basic. I'm just using Indian yellow mixed with the previous colour, which was uh, cerulean blue, just to get the wash on. I've got a Daniel Smith um, colour palette uh, available from uh, Luke Seniors yes and you can play around with the paints and dissolve them and, and see what colors they do which is pretty handy and as you come down just a bit of Viridian add that in 
uh, burnt sienna. I'd say I use more burnt sienna than anything in the world. Yeah. Go through tube after tube of burnt sienna. It mixes with absolutely everything. Great colour. I hate primary colours. Um, I prefer mixed colours. And often, you know, you get a good colour by just mis mixing the sludge around your palette. Yeah. It comes up with a nice dulled down sort of greeny grey. So I've just gone into some red, it just fell in, but who cares? That'll do something. Happy mistake. The happy mistake. Yeah. Right, we're up to the hills now. Just using a small hake brush and the trick with a horizon is to leave some gaps or make it softer at least uh -huh. in a couple of places so you can rub it out rub it out with okay. the towel <laughs> the trick is a bit like oil painting you have to in watercolor have some lost and found so you have to have sharp parts and you have to also have soft parts which watercolorists tend to think they don't need but they do all right so we'll get this tree line in over there use your water if you think you've gone wrong somewhere just use the water to soften it pull it down just catch some and, and drag it down it reduces it so just dots and dashes get that a little smaller up there i can see that you're continuously referring back to your picture all the time um this the the back image forth, yes yeah, the, what's in front of you yeah absolutely um you see things that you didn't pick up before. So I'm just going to put in uh, just a darker hill area. And in the middle, there's a road coming down that hill. So to do the road, we just leave some paint showing basically. There you go. And um, just I'm just going to put some paddocks in. When you leave the previous wash on, it leaves shapes and artifacts and things that can look like roads or pathways or something you just get a you just get a negative space yeah. which means something if you're putting on paint with watercolor it always fades back as well so you can afford to go fairly strong because it does dry lighter let me just get this back down again and, and keep using thicker paint now where we've put that wash in. I can paint straight into it with thicker paint. You can see the thicker paint. I don't know whether you can see that. Yep. But for people who are just learning watercolour, of course, um, they have a lot of trouble mixing paint. So you use thick and water and, and thin you know, on a level of one to ten. The wash was one. Yep. What I'm using now is probably nine. So that's a re that's relative to how much water you mix with watercolour. So we're still putting in trees all around the place. So I'm just following where I can see trees, which happen to be just dots at the moment. They're just dots. And the further away they are, they're smaller. To a certain extent, they're linear and they're put positioned such that you're balancing all the time balancing going from left to right part of the fact of you doing this is that so many other people can enjoy your workshops throughout the world and you've done workshops in france italy new zealand australia england and we've got denmark and germany coming up and also you've got a Baltic cruise coming up, which I think is amazing. You can go on a cruise and be with an Amanda while she teaches you watercolour painting, which is, I think is amazing. Who do you actually do that yes, with? Yes, that's Travel Right International. I have two offices, one at Bourne and one at Heathmont. And Sean Wallace is organising my trips for me. Okay. And um, yes, it's coming up in July this year. So um, anyone's welcome to join me. We have a pretty good time. Fantastic. We paint two paintings a day yeah. and the cruise ship is always good fun yeah. um, and people seem to really enjoy it so um, I've done three cruise ships before 
and uh, had a jolly good time. So as we move forward, the trees get bigger. They're coming right down at us. But this is point three that I mentioned before about putting on the tones. You've got your light, your middle, and now we're going darker. But I'm going to go darker again once I've done the shadows and the washes and, and things. So I'm just following tree lines at the moment and going out, following these. All right, just before I put the shadows on the hills at the back, I hope you realise that it's artistic licence to make a big vista, which is impossible to paint the whole length of. And this goes from zero degrees to 180 degrees. So I've chosen a section of it and I've actually pushed a bit together so that the road that you see in grey, which is way over there, I've brought it in a bit. So the big hill, the bald bit in the middle is reduced because it's not very attractive. So I've sort of pushed it in and concertinaed it down. So it's a artistic license to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're moving into point four, which is putting glazing on to get the magic, to get the light, hopefully. And then we're going to put shadows under the trees just to sit those down and anchor them so we get some, some reality happening here. Um, it doesn't have to be overworked. The trick to watercolour is not to overwork it too much. So these vineyards, we should get in now. I'm going to put a glaze over that as well after. So you don't need too many lines and you certainly don't put them often a better way to have a painting looking. Okay, so the glaze for the shadows, we're still doing point four. Yep. This is um, putting on the magic shadows. So a different brush, a neaf available at Luke's, yeah. Luke Seniors. So what we do is just very gently start something like putting on you shadows but take it up into the trees as well so don't worry about going over what you've already done because that gives it another dimension too yeah. these shadows are vital it links and it also creates a sense of dimension so who's influenced you over the years with uh, with your work you must have uh, oh gosh everybody and, and and everyone yeah i suppose my very first influence was um a watercolor that my parents had of Penley Boyd yes. that I used to look at for wondering how on earth it was done. Yeah. And I know now, but uh, you know, when you look at it when you're five or six, you haven't got a clue. So yeah. he was one of my first influences, Penley Boyd. And Lin Norman Lindsay was the next. I just fell in love with his books first and then I discovered he was a painter as well. Yeah, <laughs> so go. I found the books and then found his paintings and that was the beginning of my love affair with watercolour. Sure. And of course the great American sergeant, Whistler and Soroya, the Spanish chap. I never used to paint vertically but I did so many demonstrations for people that I had to make sure that they could see them. Of course. So I taught myself to paint vertically. So in, in, in painting the landscape, I mean you've got, you've got such a variety of work that you do. You've got you know, portraiture as well. Uh, you know, beautiful pictures like uh, a fine red. And then you've got other pictures from uh, the Gondola building, uh, Helsinki Harbour. Yeah. And one of my favourites, because I think the light is absolutely fantastic in this picture, is the Malaysian market light. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all, all about you know, the Buildings, light. people, yeah. and then landscapes. I mean, you're so diverse with what you do. Well, I think a true artist has to be able to paint all subjects in all mediums, basically. Yeah. All right, we're just going to do the foreground now. Now the foreground is just in front of us and there's a fence in front of us, but it's all grass. So the fan brush again, a bit of yeah. uh, this sort of activity and get a hake and, and pull it all around. But the actual dark uh, portrays the light yep. as well. Yep, that's, that's it. So just while this is working itself out what to do with itself, yeah. this area here is boring, what I call boring. So it's dry enough to just wet and then get a glaze 
on it too. So, you know, just wet the top because you want a distinction. So we could just glaze the bottom oh, there you go. and leave the top a bit lighter. So your eye goes into there. And yes. So I'm up to just sort of pulling it together. That's better. It's given it, see the light now focuses on this road yes. and up into here. So it's all about using your, using, use your water. It's all about the water and letting it run a bit. I'm basically not looking at that anymore. I'm basically just free falling now yeah. and finishing off the painting like I think it should be finished. Um, these hake brushes are wonderful for areas these are fudge areas, that's yeah. a fudge area, the corners, the sides of fudge areas. The last thing is a bit of white gouache. I don't have a problem using white, some do, but yeah. I certainly don't. Not too many, you just don't want too many, but you want to take your eye. Just let, let the brush just fall on the page, basically, just hit it. Right, well and the last thing, I just put a couple of uh, burnt sienna bits very thin, in strategic places. The slightest touch in the right place makes the difference between an amateur and a professional, I think. Ta-da, done! I think I nailed it. Looks fantastic. Really Good on does. you. <laughs>